Welcome to the Grace Force, everyone. This is the Grace Force podcast, and we're so excited. We got Kevin Wells here, and uh, of course, my buddy Doug is with us. Um, we want to start first with a prayer, if we could, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of, of souls. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, I, say, I open up by saying this is the Grace Force, and anybody's tuning in for the first time, you're saying, what the heck is the Grace Force? <laughs> well, actually, what it is, is it's just a, a huge amount of people who have found each other and uh, decided, and we started back in 2016 and grew really fast. We got up to about 25, 30,000 people, and one of our big military operations <laughs> was the very miraculous uh, 54-day Rosary Novena. And, um, and we actually experienced many, many miracles. Uh, people experienced them personally, and we experienced them in the culture and in the church. And so we've continued this uh, 2016, 2017, 2018. So here we are, 2019. We've done other campaigns, but this is our big one, the 54-day Rosary Novena that goes from August 15th to October 7th. So the Feast of the Assumption to the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary or Our Lady of Victory. All right, so now here we are, and we're getting very close toward the end of that 54-day Rosary Novena, and there's just a lot of stuff going on in the culture right now that's scaring a lot of people and, uh, and just making them understand we are in spiritual warfare and in our church. A lot of people are at least shaking their heads and wondering what's going on with this... Uh, Amazon Synod that's coming up, and that'll start on October 6th and go till October 27th. Uh, we even had Cardinal Burke and Bishop Snyder ask us to pray a, a daily a decade of the rosary, at least a decade. Uh, I told everyone, you know, keep praying the, your daily rosary, and then fast if you could, and however you wanted to do that. So, uh, so scores of people around the world are doing that right now. And of course, our grace force is too. And the Grace Force is now up to 57,000 people last count. And you can go to usgraceforce.com and you'll see a place where you can just hit a button and, uh, and it'll just ask you for your name and email and you're in the Grace Force, okay? And what you'll get in email is like, we're getting the daily prayers and reflections for this 54-day Rosary Novena, but also um, campaigns that are coming up now. Uh, we're coming up quickly on to the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel. We did this back last year where we started on the feast and went to the end of our 54 days, adding the chaplet of St. Michael. And uh, I'll, we'll get into this, I think, later in the show, what happened during that nine days. But it's, it's, uh, it's crazy uh, what happened. And obviously God was showing us that, yes, this is important to pray this. It's actually a prayer that asks St. Michael and all the choirs of angels to join us in prayer. So we're doing that. And then on the feast, when we end uh, our 54-day, we're actually going to start then praying the Sacred Heart Novena prayer, okay? That's the one where Padre Pio, when he was asked to pray, uh, he, would, uh, he would pray that prayer. It's an amazing prayer. And again, Lots and lots of miracles. So we're praying that at the end of the 54 until the end of the synod, okay? So we want to use all these powerful devotions, sacramentals, everything we can do uh, to that God has shown us through the saints, through the Blessed Mother, uh, for us to uh, pray mightily uh, for, for our country, for our church, and for each other. All right, so that's coming up. Now uh, we want to get into... Uh, Kevin Wells, okay, um, and Kevin Wells is, uh, I got, just got to know him, actually, and what a great guy he is, and uh, he's written a book recently that recently came out. I've got it now, and I started reading it, um, but I've actually look, uh, watched a lot of uh, podcasts and things you've been on already, Kevin, but uh, he wrote a book called Priests We Need to Save the Church, okay? Uh, you need to get this. You can... Um, Kevin, you can fill us in later because we're gonna we're gonna hit this pretty hard in our third segment. 
but uh, uh, I got mine on Amazon. So, but anyways, uh, yeah. So, uh, but we want to start out because Kevin and I've I've heard you talk about this in other podcasts and stuff too. Amazing stories, and uh, we want to start out by hearing the story about your uncle, uh, uh, Monsignor Thomas Wells, and you know uh, he was murdered. And, you know, you were very close to him. Your family was very close to him. Um, and so we, we want to start. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. Father, uh, Father, thanks for inviting me on, Doug. Thanks for uh, letting me be with you guys. I, um, Monsignor Tom Wells, uh, thousands will tell you, uh, may have been one of the greatest priests in the history of the Archdiocese of Washington. Yeah. Um, he was a man. Um, he reverenced the Eucharist so beautifully that young men would see the way he seemed to fall into a different dimension as he held up the host, knowing in his fingertips that he held Jesus Christ in his, he, and they said, I, if he can love a host like that, I should consider the priesthood. So he led many, many men, uh, well over a dozen to the priesthood. He was a man who knew that he wasn't worth anything unless anything, everything started and ended with the Eucharist. He was a prayerful man, um, holy hours every day. Years, he never missed a day celebrating the Mass. Days off, doesn't matter. Give me my mask and I'm celebrating Mass. Uh, but the thing that made him a power and the thing that made him a dynamo to thousands was he was... <laughs> He came out of the birth canal filled with joy and people could not get enough of him. Um, and the last thing I'll say, Father, is um, the Cardinal at the time, Cardinal Hickey, understood that he had a powerhouse in this priest who loved the Eucharist, who loved Mary, who loved prayer, who loved people. So whenever there was a problem at a parish, hey, Father, time to hit the road. Hey, Father, that parish is scandalized. Go. Hey, Father, that parish... Uh, they're too wealthy. They don't go to mass anymore. They're pretty arrogant. Go. He just hopscotched around the diocese of Washington, putting out fires and loving people. So thousands of people today, when he was murdered, were flabbergasted. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Doug, you, you've uh, you've read some of what he said said about this. What do you what do you think? Well, you know, I think you know, big questions probably coming to a lot of people's mind right now. You know, Kevin is, um, how was he murdered and why? Yeah. So, Doug, uh, June 8th, 2000, somebody broke into his rectory in the middle of the night. Uh, a man stumbled out of a bar high on cocaine, uh, had been drinking all night, stabbed him to death in a grotesque fashion that the deputy state's attorney said she had never seen anything like it. Uh, investigators had never seen anything like it. It was stigmata from hell. So uh, when it happened, it was like a giant shifting shadow sort of moved into the mid-Atlantic seaboard. No one could understand why it was, it was worldwide breaking news when it happened. And um, uh, eventually they caught the killer. Um, 3,000 people showed up at his funeral, more than 250 priests, bishops, seminarians, deacons. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a chrism mass for five dioceses. Um, so finally, as the years went by, uh, the secret finally broke. Um, the parish where he was murdered, the rectory in which he was murdered, um, was polluted by homosexually active men who were yeah. abused, credibly accused, Father Paul Lavin, Father Andrew Cote, and a third priest who was widely rumored to be in part of that <clears throat> homosexual circle who's no longer in the priesthood. He's disappeared. Um, so many, many thousands of people all these years later after talking to investigators and uh, they understand that once priests invite Satan into a rectory in that fashion, kind of like throwing Ouija boards all over the rectory, like, right. like Frisbees, come on in, come on in Satan, come on in demons. This place is yours now. Of course, murder is going to happen. Of course, a good priest is going to be taken out by Satan. Of course, it's going to happen. So there's, there's a symmetry, there's a wicked symmetry to it. So. So now he's no longer alive, and uh, and and I attribute, and I think many many others too. Actually, many dozens of priests in the area attributed to the evil that went on in that rectory. 
So, you know, this is something I think about, and Father, maybe you can speak to this as well, that, you know, there are people out there who will cooperate with the grace of God, which, please, Lord, that's what we're trying to do. We hope and pray. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do. The U.S. Grace Force is about getting people on board to cooperate with the grace of God, to be instruments of grace in the world. But there are people who cooperate with evil. If we just put it very simply, when bad people cooperate with evil, the good people who cooperate with grace have to stand up against the bad people who cooperate with evil. But, Father, it could be said that the, the, the devil, the enemy, the demons can try to get into the heart of someone, use that someone to attack someone else who they, they see as doing such incredible work, for example, in this case, as Monsignor Wells, that even if it wasn't a, a knowledgeable, naturally discussed, logically you know, approached plot to take his life out by someone sitting around saying, we've got to stop this man, although maybe it was, and maybe, Kevin, there's, there's something to that. I don't know. But at the very least, Father, could this not be the case where, I mean, the devils are knowing what this Monsignor Wells is doing. Um, and I know, Kevin, you, you write in your article uh, on Crisis Magazine, I read through that, that Cardinal Hickey had actually asked him to go do some pretty serious work in this particular place, in this particular rectory. There was some pretty nasty stuff going on. And one of the first things he did when he got there, or his first order of business was to tear out a hot tub. I mean, so I guess, Father, to you first, can this happen this way? Can the demons use someone to cooperate with evil blindly and stupidly, not knowing maybe what they're doing, but the demons are trying to direct them to attack someone that the demons know is doing good work for God? Father, is that, is that, is that possible? Yeah. Yes. Uh while I'm not an exorcist, I've been involved in spiritual warfare for most of my priesthood, and uh, I've seen a lot of things. And I've gotten to know a lot of uh, exorcists. I got a few that are are my close friends, and and you know we sit around and <laughs> they tell stories. And and uh, but uh, this is very common, I, from what I can tell. That uh, what is, what does the devil do? Well, the devil uses uh, the weak. Okay, you can be weak. Uh, spiritually, but you can be weakened by being intoxicated, okay? You can be weakened by uh, some kind of uh, uh, mental anguish that you're going through or so anything. Yeah, they could be uh, weakened, but, you know, there's that scripture passage that talks about um, the devil prowls like a lion, lion looking for who he can devour. Well, I had actually wrote about this in my book, uh, The Church Militant Field Manual. Uh, but uh, what does the devil do? He sizes up the herd. Okay, and what does he try to find? Somebody who's weak or separated from the herd so he can pounce on them. You know, so that's really what that scripture passage is getting at. And so that gets back to the whole idea that we need to be strong and we need to be well-connected to the herd, well-connected to the shepherd, right? Uh, and so, so uh, yes, this person who showed up and, and killed uh, Father Thomas Wells uh, was weakened, maybe in a lot of ways. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what the they suspected was going on with that? Yeah, Kevin, what do you think about this? I mean, has something been said about what this man was doing? Uh, was this a was this an intentional sort of hit, maybe, or was it just happenstance? What, what do you, what do you know about it? Well, so we all know the realm of diabolical disorientation is difficult to discern because you know. Sure. But but I, but I will say this, that the investigator and a Secret Service agent who was part of the investigation, um, they stand by firmly. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter now, 18, 19 years later, but they stand by firmly that his murderer entered the rectory that night because he had been there earlier involved with homosexual activity or, or remarkably, um, it could have been a hit out on my uncle. I don't know. Again, I have no idea because he had discovered what was going on in that rectory. I it's, candidly, Doug, candidly, Father, I, I, I simply do not care. I just know this: um, spiritual. If, if we could look to the skies right now, all we would see is black wings with what's going on in the world. What happened in Germantown, Maryland that night? Black wings were everywhere. However, however it happened, who cares? The fact is, it happened, and and a. Uh, a man, a lot of people are trying to get canonized. A, a saint is no longer with us. And he was, 
I loved him. And, uh, I was actually with him two nights before his murder. And, uh, it's just, it's, it's awful. Well, what, it's, what he was, he was sent there by Cardinal Hickey specifically, wasn't he? Correct. Yes. Yeah, and and for, for what purpose? Can you, can you shed yeah. a little light on that? And what yeah, he did his, when he first got there? That's a good question, Doug. I should have explained that his last two parishes that Cardinal Hickey assigned him to confidant, my uncle's confidant, um, was told by my uncle, I am there to route out and discover if there is homosexual activity going on in these parishes between priests. Uh, you know, that sounds so much uh, like the situation we had here with the murder of Father Coons. Um, and, uh, you know, that happened actually back in, I, I know the date because I was actually in Rome for my sabbatical in 1998 when I got word that this happened. And I had just taken him on as a spiritual director. But this is a very holy man. He was uh, associated with a lot of holy priests. Uh, Father Malachi Martin, I think, was one of them. But, you know, uh, interestingly enough, they too were assigned to root out some of the homosexual activity that was going on in the church. And so there was a suspicion that, uh, you know, they were getting too close and, uh, and they took them out. Of course, that's all conspiracy theory stuff. Uh, and the detectives to this day have not fi- found his killer, uh, but um, but that's one of the, that's one of the ones that I think a lot of people believe uh, had had happened, and so very very similar uh, to the situation with Father Thomas Wells. So yeah, so so Kevin, where, where it stands right now, I mean, the the killer was caught, correct? Yes. Yeah, and and what. How did all that happen? I mean, how did it unfold? He was caught. He was brought up on charges. Is he in jail? I mean, what's going on with the killer now? Yeah, he's, uh, I, I guess he'll be uh, the next 35 to 40 years. Uh, he was in prison. You know, he was a guy sort of born into a life of nevers, uh, just homeless tree trimmer, tree trimmer living in the woods. Um, he, uh <laughs> We, we, we've tried to reach out to him to visit him just to speak with him, but he's rebuffed every offer. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was, as you mentioned, it was a very brutal murder. I mean, there, there were multiple stab wounds and cuts on your uncle, correct? Yes. Deep plunges by his neck and head area, uh, which, which the, the deputy state attorney, Kate Winfrey said, uh, I always suspected that maybe his murderer had been abused by a priest prior. And this woman is not Catholic. She's not, she's, she's not, um, this is way back in 2000. This is even before the scandals of 2002, but this was always <laughs> from the very beginning. This was what she considered. Uh, wow. Listen, um, fascinating. Uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, why don't we end with a little prayer for your uncle who you affectionately called Tommy in the name of the father, son, and the Holy spirit. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto him. O Lord let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. And may the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we'll be right back. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who asked for thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Hey everyone, we're back. Doug Berry here with Father Richard Heilman and Kevin Wells talking about some pretty serious stuff. Going to move into now our second segment here. Uh, Monsignor John Essif. Uh, exorcist and deeply spiritual individual. And Kevin, you you had some uh, serious communication with Monsignor Essif, and he, if I'm not mistaken, uh, really got after you and prompted you to write uh, the book that we're going to be talking about in the third segment. Tell us about your interaction with Monsignor Essif and a little bit about the man. Uh, well, he changed everything. Um, he uh, let me just tell you quickly how I met him. So so in in writing this book. Uh, you know, the priest, we need to save the church. Uh, what I was hoping to do was sort of tell priests for what I thirsted for that I hadn't seen in 
you know, in many priests over the, the course of 25, 30 years, mostly as a sports writer down in Florida, being shipped around to different cities. But uh, when I started to propose the book and I wrote four or five chapters to Catholic publishers, each one said, no, we don't want your book. You have no right to tell a priest how to be a priest. And I said, of, of course I don't. It's of what I thirst for. So a couple people, a couple priests actually that were very encouraging of this book said, Kevin, you need to see Monsignor John Essef. Monsignor John Essef is a 90 year old exorcist in Scranton, Pennsylvania, that many thousands of people believe will be a canonized saint one day. And I am not one to disagree. Uh, he's, he's a soul reader. He has received a bilocation from Padre Pio in 1959. He was Mother Teresa's confessor and spiritual director for five years in Lebanon. Um, and he, <laughs> he was providential in, in my book being published. Uh, when I visited him, um, he began to understand sort of my plea and my thirst and my uh, desire to, to sort of say, hey, fathers, hey, priests, you're God's poet. Please leave me and my family to holiness. Lead us to heaven. I beg you guys, we need you to be fathers. And then he began to explain what he had seen in seminaries throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even 2000s in the United States of America. And that's when it got really interesting. Yeah, I lived through some of that myself. And uh, interesting is probably a good word for that. I, uh, I tell people that, uh, you know, when, when, when I went to seminary, uh, listen, I, I think we're in a period of time right now where we're recovering a lot that was um, that was disposed of during that period of time. But I've, I've talked about this on a previous podcast, but when I was in seminary in the 80s, uh, they didn't offer adoration, what? not one minute. They didn't expose the Blessed Sacrament for one minute in all of my seminary training. I mean, I just look back on that. And, and the other thing that's kind of astonishing about that is that guys weren't missing it or clamoring for it, you know? And then the other thing is the rosary or, or a devotion to the Blessed Mother or even the saints. You know, if you were seen as having a devotion to the Blessed Mother, praying the rosary, you were probably a, a fanatic that wasn't priesthood material. And again, the other astonishing thing is that most of the guys didn't have a devotion to the Blessed Mother and prayed the rosary at that time. I mean, that's what we've gone through in our church. Um, and so, so I think, you know, a lot can be said about what's going on in the church right now and, you know, and, you know the trouble we're having and all this stuff, but there's a lot to to say that is positive about the direction our church is going right now. Uh, but you can see why that, that guys like me who were formed during those years uh, end up being uh, parish priests. You can see why 70% of the Catholics, you know, the recent study that came out, don't believe that's God on the altar. Uh, you know, I talked, we talked earlier about, um, uh, me being over in Rome for my sabbatical, that's when I had my awakening. I was in St. Peter's Basilica. Again, I talked about it in a previous podcast. But, um, and, you know, the awe and wonder, being in the Basilica, uh, the beautiful sacred music, uh, you know, the, the precision of all the ministers, the uh, uh, servers and everything. And I just, uh, it took my breath away. And I just sat there and went, this is amazing. You know, God, you know, and I didn't deny God was on the altar. I always believed that. But it never hit a deep level. And in that moment it did. And then I went, what the heck have I been doing? Because I would sit up on that altar. I can, I, I can remember I used to sing the Eucharistic prayer. Really father? You know, you were, you, no, it was like this. Uh, father, all powerful and ever living God. And then the piano would go bring. We do well always and everywhere to give. It was a nightclub act. And in that moment in Rome, I, I said to myself, what the heck have I been doing? And everything changed in that moment. My, my priesthood just went in a completely different direction. And again, I don't think I was a bad priest. I don't think I was a great sinner or anything like that. I, it's just the way things were. No adoration, no devotion to saints. Uh, we kind of uh, uh, took lightly the mass. And it was a nice social club and, 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 uh, and, and all that. 
It's no wonder we're down to only 30% that believe that's God on that altar. Yeah, you know, Father, I, I want to jump on that. I, I, I think the way we treat the Eucharist is why we're in the dark period we Absolutely. are in today. And, and, and I'll, I'll dovetail on your comments about the, the seminary. You know, Monsignor Essif became an exorcist because of what he saw going on in the seminaries. He yeah. determined He determined that it was, this is, par- this is paralyzing words, it was the sick womb of Holy Mother Church. If you're yeah. an intentional young man, who wanted to be a good priest in the seminary, you were going to be aborted. Yeah. Either they would find a way to ask you to leave or you would just quit. And if you were malformed in this womb of the seminary, you were going to be promoted. So what he yeah. determined, because Mother Teresa said, Father, I know you think it's your job to, fo- to, to be with the poor. It's not. It's to form priests, teach yes. priests how to be priests. So he, so he traveled the country visiting seminaries and he saw it. And what he saw was horrifying. Yeah. He saw a closeted subculture was set free to roam of malformalities. He saw, if you're anti-Eucharist, as you were saying, Father, if you're anti-Mary, if you're anti-prayer, you're of the demonic. And he, yeah. what he said, he said, look, it's a, it, it's, it was a sort of a snuffing out in these seminaries of sacred traditions. It was a deformation of men and the spotless bride of Christ. And it was set free to Rome. And that's when he said, wow, I, 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 this is of the devil. He tried, and when he, oftentimes when he, when he approached the seminary rector to tell him what he sensed, census to Delhi and what he kind of sniffed out, he was politely rebuffed. And he said, it is time for me to become an exorcist. And today he trains exorcists worldwide. Yeah. I can, I can, you know, Kevin, you're not exaggerating, nor is uh, Monsignor SF, because um, I, I live that experience. Uh, um, I, I have to tell you that when, when, you know, I was, what, 23 years old when I entered seminary, and I may have met someone with same, same tracks, same sex attraction, but I didn't know it. Uh, but when I went into seminary, it was just, yikes. <laughs> uh, and, it, it, it was replete and, and, and a lot of it, you know, you, you didn't know till later. I, I, a lot of it, I found out in retrospect, but the effeminate, you know, mannerisms. And I came to understand that's almost cut their calling card and they, the gaydar and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, it, it was just, it was shocking. And so I just, I, you know, I, I found myself just kind of, you know, I, I never was mean to anybody, and uh, the, a lot of these guys were, you know, nice guys and everything. But I kind of just, you know, I just kind of put my head down and just did what I was asked to do, and 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 just uh, really survived uh, that period of time. So, Kevin Monsignor Essif, when he came to you, did he encourage you to dig into this and write about this, or what was his response when you communicated with him about the the subject? So, Doug, I told him that no publisher wanted to publish my book, and he looked me in the eye, he squared up, and he said, you write this book. You write this book. Yeah. And I went back to Maryland from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and it was a dark time, a dry time, because I had taken an unpaid sabbatical for what had lay in my heart for 25 years, mm. back in my Florida days covering sports, going from bureau to bureau to bureau, Clearwater. Tampa, St. Pete, Winter Haven, Bartow. And, and I saw something, Doug, and Father, I saw something. And this is where sort of the pilot light became ignited. If the priest, if the pastor at my temporary parish had light in his eyes, if he reverenced the Eucharist, if he spoke of Mary, if he was a prayerful priest, if he challenged us, the parish was alive. It was the exact reverse when the pastor did not have light in his eyes and did not reverence the Eucharist, et cetera, et cetera. The parish was dead. So it was easy to see. Any dummy can see it. But I saw what my uncle Tommy, Father Wells, did my entire life, and I saw the souls that he converted. I saw the priests that he led into seminaries that are now priests today, and I said, there's something wrong. So after five, six, seven, eight years, I finally said to my brothers, I was a masonry contracting company, guys, I- I'm going to give you a eight-month sabbatical. I got a book to write. 
Mm-hmm. So Monsignor Essop was really one of the first ones to say, I don't care what anyone says. Get back and keep writing this thing. Wow. Nice. Wow. Now, did he ever speak to you about what he thought the prognosis of the church is, like the direction we're going? Obviously, there's so much confusion coming out of Rome right now, Amazon Synod, and well, just countless things out there. Every day there's something you can dig a little bit, and it's right there. What did he say about the direction and where we are now? He spoke specifically to it, Doug. He said the problem in the Catholic Church today is not a lack of vocations. It's not a lack of priests. The scourge and the evil and the problem of the Catholic Church today is priests are no longer praying. He said Mm -hmm. priests need to wake up every day wanting to die for the flock as their shepherd. Mm -hmm. There are too many priests that have chosen bachelorhood lifestyles. It's unacceptable. When priests begin to start praying again, praying their breviary with intentionality, making a daily holy hour, praying rosaries daily. Our church will return to a place that Jesus wanted it when he whispered it into the ear of Jesus, uh, Peter 2,000 years ago. But until priests get on the wagon and start praying again, there's, there's not going to be any turnaround here because we need good fathers like Father Rich to lead us back to a place of grace. Well, I can see you're getting into your book right now. Why don't we take a little break and let's dive into your book. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Like I said, I just started reading it. I just got it the other day and, um, and uh, it's just amazing and so important for our time. So when we get back, we'll talk about uh, uh, Kevin's book, The Priests We Need for Our Church. We'll be right back. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Okay, we're back, and uh, here we are again with Kevin Wells. And right now we want to, we're excited, we kind (laughs) of, you know, we're kind of holding off, but saving the best for last. But, uh, you know, we want to talk about this amazing book, The Priests We Need for our, uh, to Save Our Church. And uh, th- there it is. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, I got mine on Amazon. Uh, you want to say a little bit? Why don't you go into it a little bit, but say where, where you can get it and stuff. Father, you should have gotten yours for free from the, the publisher, Sophia. I asked him to send you one, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you back if you can be one of those uh, Vince Lombardi beer mugs. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it's, so it's there, it's selling very well. It's, uh, it was released on the feast of the assumption and, and father, let me tell you something. Ooh, Some, when we started our 54 day rosary novena. Yes. Yes. Nice. A woman, a very holy woman, a daily communicant had heard of what I was doing, writing this book. And she knew, uh, I was challenging priests to be saints and she knew no publisher wanted it. She knew I was in a dry place. uh, And she said, hey, Kevin, here's what's going on. It came to me in prayer. It came to me at the holy hour. The book is in Mary's lap. She will release it when she's ready. She said it two or three times over the years, and it was released on the Feast of the Assumption. So uh, it's uh, it's the best-selling book for clergy in America right now. It's selling very well. Um, It's Father, I'm going to be very simple about it. The priests we need to save the church. If all they did was read a biography on St. John Vianney Mm. and really studied it, enjoyed it, just soaked it in, (laughs) everything would change. The the problem is, and you know this, Father, the problem is, gosh, I don't know if I have it in me. Mm. Yeah, Uh, John Vianney is my favorite. I got a relic of him back here, too, among my other ones. Um, but, uh, uh, especially his great love for making sure people were in a state of grace. You know, he would talk about what such pain he was in. If he, if he saw a sinner who was destined for hell, I have that pain. You know, I, I don't know if you know, but I actually built, a, a confessional in the front foyer of my rectory. And I have an app coming any day now that's going to, you can actually check the app to see if I'm available. But right now they just call me or just take a chance and come over. 
but you just ring the intercom and, uh, and it double rings my phone. And then I say, uh, Hey, are you here for confession? Yeah. Okay. Come on in. And there's a kneeler at my office door for them to go to confession. Okay. I, I did, I started this, I don't know how long ago, four or five years ago, but it dawned on me, you know, uh, I need to make confession as available as I possibly can. And I, I can't sit over in the church in confession. So what do I do? You know, my mind starts spinning and I came up with this and it's working so well. Uh, for anybody who wants confession at any time, I got two, three people who came today. I got two people that called me. Are you going to be around tomorrow? You know, I'll probably, you know, I probably have about anywhere from five to 10 in any day that, that come. But, but uh, again, his passion for getting people and, and yes, hell, I mean, destined for hell if, if they're not in a state of grace, but you know, their life is just disrupted and chaotic and a mess. Why? Because, you're away from the flock. You're away from the Lord. You're out. You're, you're choosing. You're, you're the prodigal son. You're choosing to walk away from the verdant pastures and the restful waters and, and, and be there with the rest of the sheep in at home with God in a state of grace. And so if you've wandered off, and again, the, that's a scripture passage of the lion sizing up the herd, right? Uh, you know, if you've wandered off, hurry up, get back, get, you know, come on over, you know, anytime. I, I, even, I even go to people when they're sick and, and they're like, I, I need confession about, it. I'll be right over. You know, I'm the pizza delivery guy of confession, but it's so needed. It's so needed because no one should go to hell and, and no one should be, live such a um, demonically disrupted and, and oppressed life outside of the arms of our Lord. Right. Father, I, I, um, I think every parish in America should average 500 confessions a month. I think yeah. confession should be held on a daily basis after daily mass. Um, it is unacceptable, unacceptable that parishes throughout the land are lucky to get 45 minutes on a Saturday. Uh, right. It's disgraceful. Um, I, um, I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Uh, outside of a bachelorhood mentality or a lack of supernatural faith. Uh, of the pastor or associate that says, ah, you know, just get on your knees and ask Jesus to forgive you. You don't need the confessional box. I don't understand it. Well, you know what it is, and this is a big part of it, is pastors will talk about that, well, I offered for a half hour, and usually I'm there by myself the whole time, or maybe one comes in. Well, then what's going on there? You're not teaching them about the supernatural power of God and the importance of being in a state of grace. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been eight years since my last confession because they're never hearing any of these sermons. Doug, what do you got to say? Well, yeah, <laughs> when I travel around the country, one of the things I do is I, when I go to a parish somewhere is I want to get a kind of a grasp or a lay of the battlefield, so to speak. So I always check the schedule. What's the confession schedule? What's the mass schedule? What's, what's the, do they have perpetual adoration? Um, kind of get a feel for those things. And the confession is, is the one that's the real kicker. You know, how often is it offered? You know, there's some parishes where it's before every mass for 15 or 30 minutes before every mass throughout the week. That's great. Um, sometimes it's Saturday only for 30 minutes or by appointment. And I think to myself, you, you got to be kidding me. I mean, realistically, how many people are, are going to call and make an appointment? It, it, it's, it's a very, very small number of people that will actually do that. Normally, it's going to be someone who's incredibly desperate, you know, really senses something s- serious or they're already devout, you know, um, enough that they have that confidence that they can do this. But for the average person who might really be ashamed of something that they're in the thick of, to pick up the phone and make an appointment is, is not necessarily going to be the first thing on their list. It, but to be able to stumble into the church and know that the confessions are available, you know, on a daily basis or much more than just 30 minutes, or as you mentioned, Kevin, 45 minutes. I mean, this is, this is insane. And if you ask me, I will also comment on the preaching part. Absolutely. We don't hear it enough. We don't hear it talked about in Catholic schools enough. A lot of the schools that I've spoken in over the years, if I bring it up, there there are some dioceses I've been told I'm not allowed back in for talking about the reality of hell. The fact that when we die and stand before God, you actually risk your eternal soul apart from God. You, You risk this. 
you know, if, if you do not embrace him through prayer and sacraments. And I've been told in several cases, well, you know what, that's a little strong for the kids. These are high school students. I mean, the age of reason is seven. From that point on, the church teaches that we're capable of understanding right from wrong, even in serious matters. And the older we get, the more responsible we, we, we need to be over that. But we're not talking about it in schools. We're not teaching it in our Catholic schools, colleges. It's not being preached from the pulpit nearly enough. I remember the words of St. John Paul II when he came to the U.S. back in the 80s, and he said, America, your communion lines are long, but your confession lines are short. And he wasn't happy about that. So absolutely. It, it, and for us who are husbands and fathers, we have to be bringing it up in our families as well. We have to model it. I've been trying to go to confession every two weeks, three weeks at most for many, 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 many years. You know, it is something that has been a tremendous help to me. It's a discipline um, and it's, it's a phenomenal way to keep yourself in that spiritual shape. It's like hitting the weight room. You know, if I don't consistently hit the weight room, I'm going to lose that, that conditioning that I need to be in. Spiritually speaking, same thing. Prayer, sacraments, they go hand in hand, folks. Come on. Yeah. So, yeah, Doug, I'm with you. It's sanctifying graces. I mean, it's Jesus Christ cracked open and alive within you. Yeah. I, you know, as far as preaching, Doug, I, um, you know, I, I, let's, let's be candid here. It's a, um, it seems to me to be a contraception of the tongue. You know, there's no life in the void. Um, it, it's, a kill, it's a killing of life. When yeah. you have a homily <laughs> that, that is um, intentional, that is uh, soul-saving, uh, whatever it might be, but it's tough to say um, the true shepherd, the true priest, you know, he preaches. It's, the, it's a blazing furnace of truth. But when you don't do it, it is a contraception of truth. It is uh, an abdication of the shepherd's role. You know, I, that's, a, that's a great topic, uh, you know, the, the courage that it takes, especially nowadays, you know, to, to speak up against um, what's going on in the world, you know, uh, and people are being attacked. I was saying earlier, you know, if you wear a red hat, you're going to get mugged. I mean, everybody's in attack mode right now, okay? And so there is a great fear, and there's a great temptation for us priests then to to take the middle road to to uh, to not talk about anything that will trigger anyone. Um, I I knew a priest uh, in our diocese that he would oftentimes get new priests, and the first lecture that he gave to them was don't talk about anything that's a hot button issue from the pulpit. Wow. And, and why? Because there, there's a part of our congregation out there that's going to get offended and they're going to leave. And so is their collection money and, and all that. The temptation is so great nowadays to, to be silent and, and to talk about, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what, but, you know, to talk well, about how I, I, I call it the, the flavor, the justice. cupcake flavor of the week, you know, and that's yeah. not to be disrespectful, but it's it's really just more of a kind of an appeasement approach that I that I see often. Yeah, it's not that. I mean, I want to. I want. There was a priest we just had down here in Tyler for a while, Father Mike, and he he would preach and and he was here for a few months and then got reassigned to another diocese in 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 the middle of the country. And he would preach in ways that I, I kid you not, you felt like you you either wanted to stand up and applaud sometimes, or you felt like you were hit by a truck, you know, <laughs> in a good way. And I would tell him that he we became friends, and I would tell him this, you know, Father, I felt like I got hit by a truck today. And he would <laughs> would laugh and say, Yeah, well, maybe the Holy Spirit wanted you to feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. you know, but, but it was I needed that. It was good, and a lot of people said that that challenging, direct, clear approach. Um, was good because, you know, if we don't swallow our pride, and we, we, we probably all heard St. Augustine's, you know, um, what are the most, what are the, the three most important virtues in order to get to heaven? Humility, humility, humility. <laughs> you know, and, and the opposite of humility, obviously, is pride. I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me that. Very dangerous thing because that's what the devil said. You know, don't tell me to serve, especially the woman, as the church fathers say. It would ultimately be this woman that he would have to acknowledge, oh, I don't want that. Not me, not, not, not this guy. And boom, the fall. 
Um, so anyway, yeah, that that preaching element, that flavor, cupcake flavor of the week, it's got to go. It really has to go. And so, can I throw one other thing in here? This has been really stuck in my crawl space for a long time now. We see these reports as to why people are having a hard time, that's putting it mildly, believing that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. I got a couple things I'd like to say. Number one, can we really watch it with the abuse of the extraordinary Eucharistic ministers? We have anybody coming out of the pews. I almost hear the theme song for Bonanza. Dun, da, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, <laughs> at the moment of communion. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but it's all these people coming up as yeah. if everybody just has that. It's if you're on the same level as the priest. And, and you're not when it comes to, receive, to to distributing Holy Communion. So we have this kind of anybody and everybody can be in the sanctuary and distribute Holy Communion. And we can all be touching Jesus like this in these ways. I just, it, that, that's not helping. And second, please, priests that are out there, God bless you, please, but preach silence after Mass. Okay, we turn it into a social hall, and it kills me. And that's not just because, you know, I want to pray there after Mass with my wife and her kids. No, it's not just that, but it changes the dynamics and appreciation of what that house is consecrated for. It's consecrated for God. So anyway, I said to get it off my chest because this has been... And you just received God. You just yes. ingested God. Exactly. You know, seconds ago. Yeah. So and you got to you gotta get... You need time to take that in. Yeah. I walk out after... I walk out of the sacristy after I'm walking down the aisle, aisle and I so want to give so-and-so a high five, but I reserve myself, you know, because they're yeah. deep in prayer sitting there, you know. We, we have a social out in the narthex, so... Everybody goes out there to do their high fiving, yeah. and and, and uh, that's great because there yeah, is a yeah. place, there can be a place for that. But right, not in the body of the church, we're still you know, and and let's let's also teach the fifteen to twenty minutes or so approximately, right, Father, before the host on a natural level breaks down in the body, um, you know, before we just run right out of church and go downstairs and start shoving down mm-hmm. coffee and donuts. You know, let's mm-hmm. take those minutes and let's hear about this so that we recognize that there's something incredible happening here and we have just communed with god in this amazing way and again back to what you had said kevin we need our priests to lead us in these areas so we can have that knowledge and that 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 uh, that 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 chutzpah that grit that something inside that will actually live these truths and be willing to die for these truths as so many of our brothers and sisters have for centuries before in our faith so, so Doug and Father, I'm, I'm I'm with you on all that, and and whenever you uh you hear this, you you want to put something practical and, re- and reparative and restorative on it. I I do think I do argue that when Archbishop Sheen said in the '60s, I think it was, "Who is going to save the church?" You know, do not look to the priest, do not look to the bishops. It's up to the Lord, uh, to to you know, sort of um. Uh, recommend a priest how to be a priest and, and a bishop to how to be a bishop. I think I argue, I argue that I think I know what he was saying in a certain degree. There is a renowned DC priest in this area. Everyone knows him. Good, solid priest, uh, been a priest for 45, 50 years. He told me something off the record. I interviewed dozens and dozens of priests, exorcists, formators for this book. He said, um, Kevin, this dynamic is diocese by diocese by diocese the same in America? It's four tiers, four tiers. First tier, three to 5% are holy priests. They start new ministries. Their cell phone is on at three in the morning. They do daily holy hours. They can't get enough of Mary. They are reverential. 16 hour work days are what they do. They would feel shame if they didn't. Three to 5% of priests in every diocese throughout America. Let's skip the second tier and let's go to the third. Third tier are priests about 5% that have suffered, they've fallen, whether it's an addiction, their alcohol, whatever, but, but they're coming back and they understand, you know what? I can be a good priest again. Last tier is seven to 10% of priests who have no supernatural faith. They simply do not believe that absolution is important in the confessional box, or maybe even after transubstantiation, when he holds up the host, Jesus Christ, maybe it's still bread in his mind. Obviously it's not, but maybe in his mind, it, it, it could be. Now, let's go back to the second tier, and I'm going to go back to Archbishop Sheen. That leads to 75% of priests, according to this good D.C. priest who knows a lot. You guys, I think both you guys might know who he is. He said 75% of priests say two things. 
with their mouth, they look up to that three to 5% of the Annie's and they say, another minute, he'd start another ministry. Uh, he wants to be too much of a priest. Maybe he's a little too, yeah, he's a little, he's making me look bad, you know, he's a hot shot. But their conscience says, my God, do I want to be who he is? But I just don't have the conviction. My cure-all is the laity, back to Archbishop Sheen, the laity approach that 75%, that priest in their parish, that pastor, and say, hey, Father, I love you, man. Thanks for leading my family. Hey, listen, um, I heard, I heard um, something you said today in the homily. I don't understand it. Um, it. It didn't make sense. You said it's, you know, the rosary is something that's sort of pre-Vatican II. I don't, I don't get it. We, we pray the rosary in our house. It's, 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 it's encouraging that 75% of flat-footed, timid, and maybe lukewarm priests to become saints. I think if the lady get involved and they encourage charitably, you know, the timid priest, that that timid priest can rise to the ranks of the Annie. That's what Archbishop Sheen was saying. The lady has got to tell him how to be a priest and how to be a bishop. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I a lot of people ask me, because I've done things like Adorientum and put in communion rail, you know, how did you get there, Father? And I said, what did Jesus, what was the first thing that Jesus did? What was his first move? He went out and got 12 guys and surrounded himself, okay? You know, so we need people to overtly support priests, okay? Not kind of quietly in your mind and, you know, you think he's a good guy. Go up to him. I got your back, Father. I support you. Uh, compliment him. I, you know, I, I, I think in this day and age when, you know, I, I, listen, I've, been, I've walked into a shopping center once and I had my collar on and a mother was with her child and she shielded her child, okay, because a man with a collar was near her child, okay? Um, we're, we're not, you know, sitting up here on, you know, uh, <laughs> with our <laughs> arrogant egotism. Uh, go up to the priest and tell him, you know, what you think, you know, in terms of supporting him and, and in terms of complimenting him. Help him, give him, make him strong. See, a, a lot of what complimenting is, is not so much to build someone's ego, but to give them more strength and courage and, and, and conviction that, that what they are doing and what they want to do, uh, you know, uh, is, is well received. Okay. And, and so you support your priest lady, right? Bingo. Yeah. Bingo, Father. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things I like to do is tell priests, thank you for being a priest. And I've had several priests respond almost in shock. You know, thank you for being a priest, Father. You know, you said yes, yeah. and without you, we wouldn't have the sacraments. And some of them are stunned. And one actually wrote um, a letter to our ministry. We, Me and some uh, young college students who were working for me at the time in ministry radix years ago, were in an airport. And he saw a priest, one of the guys that was working for him, he saw a priest in line to get his ticket, at this, at the ticket counter there. And, and he walked over to him and said, Father, thank you for being a priest. And it was just something we all did regularly. And, and he handed him a little card that said, uh, Jesus, the sweetest name ever spoken. And then it had our, our, our mailing address on it back before internet was such a big thing, you know. And um, he wrote us a letter. And he actually said in the letter, I can't tell you what that meant to me. Because it had been a rough day, you know, it's tough as a priest sometimes. And when this young man came up, I don't know who he is. He didn't give me his name. And he said, thank you for being a priest. He said, I actually could hold my head up and actually feel, wow, that, that, that means something to me. Doug, that's absolutely beautiful. We should be praying litanies for our priests every day. All Catholics should be praying for the priest, especially today. I don't care if you think your pastor's lukewarm. I don't care if you got the greatest priest in the world at your pastor. It does not matter. It simply does not matter. We need to pray for our priest today. Yeah. Our Lady of Akita <laughs> said that in 1973. Yeah. She said, pray the, the prayers of the rosary. Pray them very much for the Pope, the bishops, and the priests, because yep. the demon would be especially implacable, <laughs> relentless against the consecrated soul. And so you're right, Kevin. It is absolutely paramount that we pray 
you know, I, I pray in, I pray daily rosary and I always include at the end of my prayers specifically for the Pope and clergy clergy. And I name some by name, father Heilman, you are one of them. I name by name. Awesome. <laughs> so you're in my daily rosary. Thanks Doug. Uh, you bet. I really appreciate it. Oh, you bet my friend. <laughs> so, but, but you're absolutely right, Kevin. It's got to be a daily thing. <laughs> Get ourselves in that habit. It's a good holy habit to be in it, to teach our kids you know, ingrain it in them that this is just what you do. You pray for these men who have given their lives over. They've answered the call, the person of Christ in persona Christi. Pray for them because the demons are especially relentless against these consecrated souls. To destroy them, as you said earlier in the show here, uh, you know, Kevin, without the priests, without that, I like to say that spiritual officer on the battlefield, we are in so much more trouble than we can ever, ever understand. That's it. Yeah. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Father. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, you know, uh, the the priest is everything. You know, we we know what Satan's told Vianney. He said, if there was two, two or three more, my kingdom would be empty. So, yeah. so we we need to encourage priests to strive, just like that. Your Lombardi glass, there, uh, Father. Just to strive for excellence, strive for sanctity. Yeah, hold that, hold Lombardi. that Lombardi up. Why don't you read that off? Read that off. Uh, uh, Vince Lombardi, the coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 60s, whose name is on the Super Bowl trophy, once said, uh, nobody's perfect, but if you chase perfection, you'll catch excellence. That's what my mug says. So, Father, can you can, – I hate to impose here, but can we, can we have a, a brief respite? Can you tell the folks about your, uh, your, your, your football career? Yeah. Speaking of Lombardi. Oh, yeah. We were going to talk about that. <laughs> No, I, I just was saying that um, we were talking when we weren't recording that uh, I'm an old football player from way back, and we got on the whole Green Bay Packers things because I took Jerry Kramer's number, and uh, those who aren't into football a lot might not know who the heck that is, but uh, he's most notably known for the the block, as they say, in the ice bowl uh, against the – there it is, Doug. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, anyways, I took his number and I went on to be an all-state football player and wanted to be a Green Bay Packer. And then God broke my neck uh, my first year in college and it was a, um, a career ending injury. And then so I shifted gears and, and ended up uh, rising from my parents' basement four years later saying, I want to go to seminary. Uh -huh. And uh, after we got the uh, paramedics there, you know, got them off the floor, you know, <laughs> in shock. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, so that, that, uh, that changed my career, but I told you this story that because, uh, you're a sports writer, uh, that's your career. Four so right, I yeah. 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 So, well, listen, um, thank you so much, Kevin, please everyone get this book. It's amazing. Uh, everybody's talking about it. It's so needed right now. Okay. In our times, our challenging times that we're in the priests we need to save our church. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, God, God bless. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God.